the guy that's messing with the thermostat. Hey, I'll sign in. <laughs> uh -oh. got it going on. <laughs> you know, it's wonderful to have a worship team that um, doesn't entertain us, but ushers in the presence of God. I just thank uh, our worship team for blessing us uh, week after week, and um, you know, you probably don't realize this, but they practice and they select the hymns, and um, it's a lot more involved than what you see on Sunday morning. So, thank you, thank you, thank you. This morning, I'm continuing my series in the Book of Romans. We're uh, headed to the finale here pretty quick. Uh, we're in chapter 15. We have one more chapter to go. And this morning I'm, I'm preaching from Romans 15, verses 22 and uh, 22 to 29. And this morning I want to talk about seven reflections on knowing the will of God. And um, as an aside, um, Paul, in this particular text, says, I'm coming to Rome someday, I hope. See, a lot of times we, we have plans to to do this or do that or do the other. But our plans don't always line up with reality, and we'll see that in the text this morning. And uh, I just um, thank God for the privilege to, to have this pulpit and to be able to preach his word week after week. And um, let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll get into this morning's message. Gracious Father, I thank you. I thank you again, Lord, that uh, your word is so powerful, your word is so effective, your word is so great and grand. I pray, Lord, that we would renew our minds with your word, that you would allow us to write your word on the tablets of our hearts, that your word would be transformational, that your word would bless us, that your word would help us and lead us and guide us to all truth. Bless us now, Lord, as we receive a download from heaven from this mighty book of Romans, probably the, one of the most doctrinally expansive books in the entire Bible. We praise you, we worship you, we give you honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, a lot of people wonder what are, what are the, the factors to know the will of God. And um, that's probably one of the most popular questions that a pastor receives. You know, what's God's will for my life? And most people have to understand, 95% of God's will is written in his word. And so as you study his word, as you press into his word, his word has the vast majority of his will for you clearly written, clearly spoken, without uh, any equivocation. And... Um, I tell people that they need to familiarize themselves with the word. And then you have people that say, well, I don't read well, or if I read, I don't understand. The Bible does not tell us that faith comes by reading. It says faith comes by hearing. And now, I mean, we have Bible apps that you can get on your phone that uh, can play the word back to you. So there's really no excuse even if you can't read the Word of God, you can, you can listen to the Word of God because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And so we look at Romans 15 here. We're going to look at verses 22 to 29. And it offers us kind of an interesting, fascinating glimpse into the mind of the Apostle Paul, probably one of the greatest apostles of all. And essentially, it's Paul's answer to this question, why I haven't visited Rome yet? We know from the first, uh, the first chapter of Romans, Romans 1, verses 11 through 13, that Paul longed to visit the church at Rome, but he had been prevented from doing this because of his other duties elsewhere. His itinerary and traveling from place to place to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. But now that this particular letter is nearly over, he returns to this theme at the end of Romans chapter 15. 
And this time he offers a more detailed explanation about his current travel plans. And in one sense, this paragraph may not seem very important to us because it simply records a personal itinerary 2,000 years ago. So you might say, well, what's the point? You know, that's so long ago, who even cares? But these verses provide us with a glimpse into the thinking of the Apostle Paul if we looked at him more closely. And as such, they help us understand why he did what he did and the underlying priorities that guided his life. See, all of us have priorities that guide our lives, but most of us have misguided priorities that guide our lives. We chase the wrong things and we, we, we want to do the wrong things and our, our life's not really aligned with Jesus Christ, but, you know, um, Paul's priorities in this text are, are fairly easy to understand, and I think this alone is valuable because it speaks to a need we all feel for guidance in the decisions that we make and the direction that we take. It's kind of interesting because, um, you know, like I said a moment ago, finding God's will is 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 such a, a hot topic for a lot of people you know they they struggle to find God's will and they struggle to do God's will and it's, this is especially true when we're at different crossroads of our lives what should I do what should I do you know how should I handle this and you know people continually come to these decisions and you know they wonder you know what I should do you know the list of what I should do is are kind of endless. And it's kind of interesting because wouldn't it be wonderful if one day we could just figure it all out in advance? Hmm. What if we had the opportunity, you know, back in the day um, before COVID, you know, business people often, they meet for lunch or they meet for dinner to discuss business plans and business contracts and business deals. Suppose... We had the wonderful opportunity to have lunch with Jesus. And we had the opportunity to ask him, what should I do? You know, suppose the Lord himself granted you 45 minutes or an hour in which, you know, you could just have lunch or dinner together. You could ask the question, any question that you wanted to ask him. You know, surely somewhere along the way, you would probably say something like this. Lord, you know, am I doing what you want me to do? I mean, we all should be asking ourselves that question, whether we have lunch with him or not. It's probably not uh, realistic to think that anytime soon any of us would have lunch with him. But, I mean, um, what should I be doing? I mean, have you ever asked yourself that question? Lord, what should I be doing with my life? What should I be doing with my time? What should I be doing with my resources? What should I be doing with the, the remaining time I have left on this earth? I mean, you'd probably say, please let me know. But, you know, it's kind of interesting. I mean, what people are really asking is, you know, I want to know if, if my life lines up with what the Lord wants from me. The only problem is, you know, we can't really have that kind of meeting. We can't have lunch or dinner with Jesus in a literal sense, as I imagine. But, you know... Some of us, I mean, you know, we should talk more with God because God really will tell you what he wants in your life. And, you know, this kind of face-to-face -face exchange will probably have to wait until you're in heaven. But now and then, I mean, you know, all of us, we have lots of choices to make. You know, we make thousands of personal choices, big ones, small ones, some trivial, some life-changing and, um, you know, what we're doing is hoping, trusting, and praying, or we should be hoping, trusting, and praying, that we're doing God's will. Because if we're not doing God's will, I have to ask you this morning, what the heck are you doing? I mean, if you are not in God's will, or if you're not seeking God's will, I mean, what are you really doing with your life? And that brings me back to this text, this text from Romans in 15 verses 22 through 29 and it gives us a glimpse into the heart and the mind of one of the greatest Christians who ever lived on this earth the Apostle Paul 
And here is his explanation to the Roman Christians of why he had not come yet to visit them. And from this we can glean from what he wrote of what really the will of God is. The first thing that I want to tell you this morning out of these, um, I told you I'll give you seven reflections. The first reflection is the Apostle Paul made decisions on the basis of well-ordered priorities. See, some of us, we just are so impulsive. We bounce here, we bounce there. We don't have well-ordered priorities, and a lot of us don't even have God well-ordered amongst our priorities. I mean, how important is God in the priorities of your life? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, how important is God in the decisions that you make, in the time that you spend, in the resources that you expend. And fundamentally, Paul is saying that he's been hindered, if you looked at verse 22, from coming to Rome because he focused his efforts on preaching to people who have not yet heard the gospel. So what he's saying is, I can't come to Rome right now because I'm busy preaching the gospel to people who have never heard the gospel. We see that in verses 18 through 21. And therefore, Paul was to, has delayed his trip to Rome while, peach, while preaching from Jerusalem north through Asia Minor, which is now modern-day Turkey, across the Aegean Sea to Greece, and then through the region of Acrylium, which is now modern-day Albania, northward along the Balkan Peninsula. And when he says... In verse 22, that he no longer has any room for the work in those regions. What he really means is that he's helped to plant churches in many of those major cities so that eventually the gospel itself can spread to the outlying areas from each of those places. That work has taken Paul many years, but now the work is done. And he feels free to consider making a trip back to Rome. His ultimate goal is to preach the gospel in Spain and at the western edge of the Mediterranean Sea. And for Paul, that would be going to the uttermost parts of the earth. You have to understand, back then they didn't have planes, trains, and automobiles. So the only way they could travel is either by boat or by foot, or if you could find a willing camel, maybe one of those. But there were no planes, trains, and automobiles. So he hopes to stop in Rome and encourage the church there while on his way to Spain. That's ultimately his goal. The next reflection that I want to give you this morning is Paul placed a high value on promoting unity in the body of Christ. We've talked about this many times, but even that trip to Spain has to be delayed while because he must first go to Jerusalem to take an offering that he had collected from Gentile Christians to the poor Jewish believers in Jerusalem. We see this in verses 25 through 27. You see, this is the theme he touches in several of his epistles, most notably in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. See, Paul felt keenly for the, for the plight and the circumstances of his brothers in Jerusalem who were suffering enormous poverty. So everywhere Paul went in the Gentile world, he took an offering for the Jerusalem saints, thus revealing both his heart for the poor and for his desire to promote unity in the body of Christ. It's kind of interesting because these are two groups of people that always didn't see eye to eye and didn't agree on a lot of things. But Paul has a heart for both of them. Far from being simply an armchair theologian, just speaking words, Paul cared deeply about the suffering of the church in Jerusalem. And accordingly, he understood that Gentile believers sharing the same spiritual blessings as the poor saints, they had a solemn obligation to relieve the suffering of the poor saints in Jerusalem. Jewish believers. But in reality, it's more than just an obligation. See, it was a joy to the Gentiles to make that offering 
to the Jerusalem church. And that's the point that Paul makes in verse 28. Those who have, the rich help the poor, and the strong support the weak. And in this way, the church is made stronger and the church is made more unified as Christians from different ethnic backgrounds support each other. How wonderful that the Gentiles, who the Jews usually look down on, could support the Jewish poor people in Jerusalem. The third reflection that I want to share this morning is Paul understood the importance of personal integrity, especially in terms of financial matters. See, most people agree that Paul wrote this letter to the Romans while he was in Corinth. A simple little geography could kind of help us here. See, going west, he went directly from Greece to Spain, a trip of about 1,500 miles. See, from Greece to Rome was 650 miles, and from Rome to Spain was 850 miles. And then going east, first, he had plans to go east. He intended to go from Corinth to Jerusalem, which was about 800 miles. So he's really planning a three-part trip. From Corinth to Jerusalem was 18, 800 miles, and then from Jerusalem to Rome was 1,400 miles, and from Rome to Spain was 850 miles. This is a total of 3,050 miles on foot wow. or by boat. No cars, oh. no plane, no train. See, in the first century that meant a long, difficult journey. And that journey was mostly by foot. And now that he's taken up the money, you know, why doesn't he just send it on to Jerusalem to those who he might trust, those representatives that uh, he knew that he could hold responsible, said he could get on uh, with the business of just going to Rome or Spain directly. And the answer here, I think, involves integrity. See, Paul wants the poor saints in Jerusalem to know that as the apostle to the Gentiles, we see this in Galatians 2, verses 6 through 10, <clears throat> Paul cared deeply about his Jewish brothers and sisters because he was Jewish. So, of course, he cared deeply about his Jewish brothers and sisters, but he was the apostle to the Gentiles. And he wanted to make sure that there is no question about how the money is handled since, in no doubt, it amounted to quite a considerable sum. You know, it's kind of interesting because, you know, people want to know that if they gave money, it's used for the purpose that they gave it. And, you know, Paul wanted to make sure that this money was delivered to the poor people that it was intended and collected for. So Paul determined to do all things. And he wanted transparent honesty so that he committed himself to take that long journey back to Jerusalem so that he could say to the Jewish believers, here is the money that the Gentile saints have contributed towards your need. And this one act will go so far to cement the bonds of trust between the Jews and the Gentiles who were separate wings of the church. Another reflection that I want to share with you this morning is Paul did not exactly know when he was going to come to Rome. Although he clearly states that his great desire was to visit the church at Rome, he could not say when he would make that journey because he just wasn't sure himself. Paul lays out his general priorities. He explains his immediate plans. And then he says, I hope to come to Rome on my way to Spain. See, this is the way of wisdom when you really think about it. He doesn't set dates or makes promises that he can't keep. The best he can do is to say that he has this infinite an infinite statement and you know you have to understand you know in doing God's will it's just the most prudent way to follow because he didn't know the future you know he didn't know how sure the future events would play out so he just decided that he told him he was coming he just didn't know when and he didn't make any promises when Harold Macmillan was the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom he was asked 
what represented the greatest challenges for a statesman? And Harold Macmillan famously replied, events, my dear boy, events. See, life has a way of catching us by surprise. Yeah. Sometimes events catch us by surprise, circumstances catch us by surprise, and we make our plans and we ought to plan carefully for the future, but our plans do not equal God's will. See, a lot of times we think we, we make our plans and that's God's will. No, those are your plans. <laughs> See, your plans don't always equal God's will. See. Events come and intervene and you know, when Harold Macmillan said, events, my dear boy, events, it's true. You know, it's kind of interesting because as a pastor, you know, you get phone calls during the night. You know, you have people that face financial crisis sometimes, most of the time, because of their own doing. You have the unexpected pregnancy and problems. And, you know, it's people that are um, not meant for each other ask you questions like, pastor, will you marry us? You know, I've had to tell people no, and they get mad at you. You know, it's like, <clears throat> it's interesting because I, um, I pray about the people that I marry, and I'll only marry people that I think should be together after much prayer and consideration and counseling. But, you know, it's funny because people come to me and say, Pastor, we want to get married this weekend. I said, not with this guy. And, you know, and then they get angry. You know, but other lives happen to us as well. You know, you go to the doctor and the doctor looks you in the eye and says, I'm sorry, you've got cancer. Changes your plans. Wow. Life is just kind of like that. Yeah. Things come up and circumstances come up and the best plans sometimes go astray. We've heard it before. The best laid plans of mice and men will go astray. But Paul understood this truth. So when announcing his plans, he didn't make promises that he couldn't keep. And he didn't set dates needlessly. The next observation that I want to make this morning is, Paul remained positive about the future that he could not guarantee. See, a lot of times we think we know the future, but not so fast. In verse 29, Paul says this, I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. Those words contain a note of kind of optimistic confidence. Not only does he fully expect to come to Rome, he fully expects to come to Rome with the blessing of the Lord. How many times on your way home do you think that this is the way you're going to enter? You know, instead of stirring up some strife or trouble, when you're driving home from a long day at work and you're already too tired or beyond uh, the point of being uh, rational, you say, I'm going to come home with the blessing of the Lord for my kids or for my spouse. What a blessing we would be if we came to church saying, you know, when I come to church today, I'm coming with the blessing of the Lord for the church and for the other believers who are there. How many times have you entered into a situation or you journey to a particular place. You know, it's kind of funny with the holidays right around the corner, Thanksgiving and Christmas. You know, a lot of families fight when they get together for their holidays. But how different it would be if I, if I told you, you know, when we get together for Thanksgiving or Christmas, I'm coming with the blessing of the Lord. Mm -hmm. I'm coming to your house with the blessing of the Lord. Amen. You know, think about those words for a second. Beneath those words lies the bedrock in God's sovereignty over the details of life itself. He believed that exactly what it says in Psalm 37, 23 is true. In the King James Version, it says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. See, people make a lot of steps, and you know, I was talking about that just recently in my other study on Wednesday night, but... You know, the steps of a good man, they're not ordered by you. The steps of a good man are ordered by him. And that the Lord would make his way straight. See, in Proverbs 3, 6, it says exactly that. That the Lord would make your way straight. 
See, a lot of you, you walk crooked ways. You walk your own way. But the Lord wants to make your way straight. And that doesn't mean that his way will be easy. See, God's way is not always the easy way. Sometimes God's way is far from that. It's not easy. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 23 through 29, Paul, in his journey, speaks of what it takes to be a Christian, minis- a Christ- a Christian missionary. He says, I've been beaten with lashes. I've been beaten with rods. I've been stoned and shipwrecked. And he has been on frequent journeys, in dangers of rivers, in dangers of robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, dangers from false brothers, in toil and hardship, though many a sleepless night, in hunger and in thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. That doesn't sound like a lot of fun. But that's verses 26 and 27 um, from 2 Corinthians 11. Not to mention the daily pressure of taking care of so many churches in so many different places. You find that in verse 28. So Paul's life was far from easy. See, most of us, we just wish... I just want to sign up for that easy, breezy life with no problems, no difficulties, no struggles, no complications. Well, that life is after you're dead, if you're in heaven. See, that life isn't here. As long as you're in this life, there's going to be struggles, there's going to be problems, there's going to be difficulties. You know, so Paul mentions that he had these churches to take care of, His life was far from easy, yet he learned in every possible circumstance and situation to be one thing, content. See, most of us, we fuss and gripe and complain. We moan and groan. Well, there's a few other adjectives I could add, but it's probably not appropriate from the pulpit. But, you know, most of us, we're not content. But Paul said whether in ease or in enormous difficulty, in Philippians 4, verses 11 and 12. See, Paul's life at times was easy, at times was enormously difficult. He said, through the strength that Christ provided. Uh, Philippians 4, 13. How can a man be content while being beaten again and again and again. How could a man be content suffering from so many different trials? The answer must be that Paul had a big view of God. See, when we have God in focus, no matter what we're dealing with, that changes everything. See, God had a big view of God, one view that was so large that it encompassed the worst that could possibly happen to him. And he'd still be okay. He'd still be content. You see, what most of us don't have is, we have to have the realization that the bigger your God, the greater will be your capacity to survive the darkest moments of life. See, when life gets tough, the bigger your God, the better your life will be. So when Paul says that he plans to come to Rome with the full blessing of God, what he means is that he expects that no matter what may transpire, no matter what might happen, no matter what circumstance may come about, God will orchestrate the events to allow him to come to Rome. And when that happens, he will be blessed and he will bring a blessing to the church of Rome. And that's how he rolled. In spite of the hardship, in spite of the difficulties, in spite of all that's transpired, he would be so blessed that he would literally bring a blessing. Is that how you travel through life? No matter what happens, no matter what circumstance you find yourself in, 
You'll be a blessed person and you'll bring a blessing to those that you encounter. See, Paul's faith gave him optimism about a future that he could not guarantee. And that's what our faith should do. Our faith should actually give us op optimism. We should be positive. We should be, we should be far from negative Nellies or Nelsons, negative Nelson or whatever. I mean, our faith should give us optimism no matter what. The next observation that I want to make this morning is this. Paul's delay in going to Rome proved a blessing that he could never have imagined. See, in verse 23, he says that for many years he longed to come to Rome. Not just a week or two or not just a month or two. For many years, he longed to come to Rome. And he expands upon that in Romans uh, chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, by saying that he had been praying without ceasing that someday he might come to Rome to minister to them and be mutually encouraged together with them. See, that's why Christians should come together, so that we can mutually encourage one another, build each other up, edify each other. That's the point. You know, the writer of Hebrews says, to forsake not the gathering of the brethren. You can't be encouraged sitting on your couch or laying in your bed. But that's where some people spend most Sundays, most Wednesdays. See, no one in Rome could doubt his deep love for a church that he has never visited. See, at this point in time, he had never visited this church. The long list of names in chapter 16 demonstrates his intimate knowledge of this particular congregation. He knew them by name. But we may ask if Paul so greatly desired to go to Rome if he prayed about it for so many years, if those Christians were on his heart every single day, if he longed to see them so deeply, why didn't God answer his prayer sooner? A lot of us probably wonder that. God, why don't you answer this prayer now? Because I prayed it five minutes ago. See, the text offers one answer. Paul was hindered, but not in a bad way. Not all hindrances come from the devil. See, some hindrances come from God himself. See, we think when the light turns red, you know, the devil's at it again. He just stopped me. Not all hindrances come from the devil. In this case, Paul was hindered by God's call to preach the gospel where Christ had not yet been named. Someone has said that had he gotten back to Rome before uh, and if he had established the church there first, but this being the case, actually, Paul would focus on being a pioneer missionary to cities that he traveled in before Rome, Turkey, Greece, Albania, and along the Balkan uh, Peninsula. See, if we study Paul's missionary method, it's clear that he went to the leading cities in a region, knowing that if he could plant the gospel in a major city, it would eventually spread to the smaller cities and towns, and eventually to the rural villages around all these major cities. And in this sense, Paul had a missionary strategy that was designed to make the best use of his limited time on earth and his limited strength. We could ask the question another way. Paul, since Rome is the capital of the empire and is therefore the most important city in the world, what happens in Rome matters more than what happens in Athens or Corinth or Antioch or even Jerusalem. See, Rome at the time ruled the world. Why not drop everything and go to Rome? Why not strengthen the church at Rome first and build a strong base for the gospel? I actually think those considerations weighed heavily in the mind of Paul the Apostle. He knew that Rome was the number one city in the entire world at the time, and that's part of the reason he wanted to go there so badly. So why didn't he just drop everything and go to Rome first? Fundamentally, he knew his calling, and he stuck to it. Furthermore, 
If he had gone to Rome earlier, we might never have had the majestic letter that Paul wrote to the people in Rome. And beyond all questions, Rome is the greatest of all of Paul's epistles and letters. It's the ultimate statement of his theology of God. It's the ultimate statement of his theology of sin and salvation. Martin Luther began his preface to his commentary on Romans this way. This epistle is really the chief part of the New Testament and the very purest gospel and is worthy not only that every Christian should know it word for word by heart, but occupy himself with it every day as the daily bread of the soul. Wow, what a commentary. C.H. Dodd called Romans the first great work of Christian theology. I would probably go a little further. It's not only the first, but it's probably the greatest work of Christian theology. Romans is a doctrinal masterpiece. It's a masterpiece of Christian theology if you really understood the book. No one in 2,000 years has written anything even close to match what Romans has to say. And how much poorer would the church be if we didn't have the book of Romans? And you know what? As I consider all of this, Paul wrote Romans in a rather detached, straightforward style precisely because he had never been to Rome. He had never physically been to Rome. And he did not know the church members in Rome. But contrast the style with his letter to Galatians, a church that he personally founded himself. There he writes with deep emotion. The same is true of 1 Thessalonians. That book is written with deep emotion. Where Paul knew the people, he wrote in a more personal style. But Romans, when he didn't know the people, he wrote in a didactic fashion. This actually works to our advantage because in Romans, we have the clearest statement of Christianity in the entire New Testament. Luther, the founder of the Reformation uh, uh, movement, was right. Romans is really the very purest gospel in the New Testament. Though Paul didn't intend it this way, his long delay in visiting Rome has proved a blessing to the entire Christian church, not just then, but for the last 2,000 years. The last observation and reflection that I want to make this morning is this. Paul could not have foreseen how his plans would transpire. See, we know that Paul would eventually make it to Rome. However, he wrote from Corinth, he planned to travel on his own to Jerusalem, which he did. And then on his own to Rome, which he didn't. See, the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostle, the book right after the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, then comes the book of Acts. The book of Acts records how he was arrested in Jerusalem, imprisoned and tried in Caesarea, and then sent in chains by ship to Rome. You see, in Acts 27, for the account of the shipwreck along the way. See, Paul was a prisoner, and the ship took a bad turn and was wrecked. And then he was placed under house arrest. It appears that he was later released. He continued his ministry, and then he was imprisoned again. And according to church tradition, he ultimately was beheaded when he got to Rome. Hmm. A man that just wanted to preach the gospel, imprisoned many times, shipwrecked, and beheaded for the cause of Christ. See, Paul knew none of this when he wrote this letter to Corinth. And by the way, we don't know whether or not he ever made it to Spain, because the gospel's not clear on that. There is some evidence that perhaps he did make it to Spain, but because it's not written in Scripture, we're not certain whether he did or not. There's another little piece to this puzzle that's kind of interesting. We know that Paul made it to Jerusalem. We know that Paul made it to Rome. 
And we know that if Paul made it to Spain, we're not sure. But we know that Paul didn't know about his pending arrest. Paul wouldn't be able to foresee his arrest, his trial, his imprisonment, his shipwreck, and then his house arrest. He wouldn't have known any of that was in the future. And when he wrote Romans, he didn't know that. But based on what we know about Paul, I don't think that would have changed his plans at all. He knew that there were circumstances and situations that would cause problems because of his position as the greatest minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, Paul called Paul, the Apostle Paul, he felt called to go to Jerusalem. He felt called to go to Rome. How he got there, it didn't matter. On his own will, in chains and shackles, to him, it didn't really matter. He made his plans, but he left the outcome in the hands of Almighty God. See, most of us would think, well, he was a complete failure. He was arrested and brought to Rome. That's not true at all. He just didn't know how it would work, but he made his plans. And that is where we all must end our search to know God and to know his will. It's good to make our plans based on the right priorities, having the right good and godly priorities in life. See, human planning and divine guidance are allies. They're not enemies. See, some of us, we think, well, human planning is futile because I just want God to tell me what to do, and then when God doesn't tell me what to do, we do whatever the heck we want anyways. Okay. That never works. No. See, but like Paul, we often find that our plans are delayed. See, Paul didn't exactly get what he planned, and sometimes our plans are changed completely by events that we could not even foresee. So, where does this leave us as we face big and small decisions in life? The answer is, it depends on one thing. You know what the answer really is? It depends on the size of our God. You see, how big is your God or how little is your God? That's where it all depends on. See, if we serve a big God who is truly sovereign over all the details of life, then we can move forward by faith knowing that our life is in his hands. Otherwise, not so much. Here's some advice for everyone who wants to know and do God's will. This is probably, like I said earlier, one of the biggest questions people ask me. What's God's will? It starts in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Seek first God's kingdom. Seek first the kingdom of God. See, most of us, that's not the first thing we seek. That's the last thing we seek. We do what we want. We plan our days according to what's in our head or what we have to do. But the Bible says in Matthew 6, 33, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then it says, then all these things will be added unto you. Most of us, we chase all the things we want, and we chase God last. And that's if we have any time left to chase God at all. But my advice to you this morning is, you know, to, in order to do God's will, you have to seek God's kingdom in your life first. Seek God's kingdom in the world first. The second point that you can know to do God's will is make the best plans that you can with God as the overseer of those plans. See, a lot of times, I'm sure we make plans and God's in heaven laughing at you. It's like, are you serious? That's what you're going to do with this day that I gave you? See, we should make the best plans that we can with God's help. The third point that we could do to know God's will is humbly submit your plans to your Heavenly Father saying, your will be done. Mm. See, most of us say, God, here's my plans. Now, this is my will. 
You know, how many times when uh, we make our plans, we should say, Lord, I submit what I want to do to you, and I pray that your will be done. The fourth point in terms of knowing God's will is take the next step in front of you. See, some people are afraid to take the next step. You know, you have to take the next step that's in front of you if you want to make any progress at all. See, some people want to make quantum leaps. It's funny because sometimes um, I encounter young people that want to be in the ministry. I'm going to do this great thing, and I'm going to do that great thing. Well, first you've got to take the first step that's in front of you before anything happens. And then my fifth point is trust God to take care of everything else. See, if we worry about us trying to take care of everything, we probably won't do anything. If you wait for, you know, let's say you're traveling to uh, northern Macomb County. You know, if you wait for every light to turn green, you'll never start. Every light's never going to be green, but you got to get started someplace, and you got to trust God to take care of everything. You know, it's kind of funny because I've been thinking about this for a while. I've been thinking about my own personal journey and, you know, where God wants me to go and what God wants for this church. You know, and I've come to the conviction, you know, that has helped me greatly. Because in thinking about all of this, you have to understand one thing. The will of God is not a destination. The will of God is a journey. See, most of us think, you know, if I only get to this place, I'll be all set. Really? You know, you have to think of the will of God as being a journey. You know, and allow for changes and, you know, alterations and such. And as I ponder all of this, even from a personal sense and from my own personal future, I see some things clearly that, while other times I see other things that are just a mystery because I don't understand them. And then as I was thinking about this message, I remember what Job said. You know the book of Job? I mean Job. Job said, he, God, knows the way that I take. And when he, God, has tried me, I shall come out as gold. That's Job 23.10. See, that's the ultimate goal for all of us. See, God knows the way that I take. He knows that he will try me along the way. And what I want is to know that as I've been tried, I will come out as gold. See, gold, as it's heated, it gets to that temperature where the dross and all the impurities are skimmed off. And then because of that heat, that's all that's left is pure gold. I'm not sure if that helps you. I hope it does. But God knows the way that I take, even when I don't know the way that I take. Amen. God knows the way that I take, even when I can't clearly see the way that I take. And God knows the way I take, even when the way I take gets me lost. You know, sometimes we think, well, whoa, 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 you know, this isn't clear to me. Well, that's okay. When you completely trust God, God knows the way. See, walking with journey, I mean, walking with Jesus, rather, is a journey. Walking with Jesus is not a destination. And when you're walking with Jesus, you know, somewhere beyond the horizon, you know, we're going to be glorified. But even when we think we've arrived, don't kid yourself, you haven't. Even when we think, aha, I've made it at last. You know, then suddenly life changes and there's a sharp bend in the road that takes us in another direction. See, even if you think you've arrived in this life, no one fully arrives in this particular life. We all press forward, forgetting those things that are beyond and pressing 
on to the high mark of the calling of God and Jesus Christ. Isn't that what the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 3, verses 12, 13, and 14? See, Paul said, of all the things I know, this one thing I do. Not some of the things he knows. He says, of all the things. This is the greatest theologian ever. He says, of all the things I know, this one thing I do, I press forward. I forget those things are behind. See, most of us, you know, we should stop at Myers and buy like the super-sized lint roller things, especially if you have dogs. But, um, you know, you guys carry too much junk. We have baggage and suitcases and all this crap we're trying to carry. And we can't move forward because we got all this baggage we're trying to drag through life. See, unless we forget those things that are behind, how in the world are you ever going to press to the mark of the high calling of your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, you got to take your stuff to the curb and let the garbage man take it away. You know, sometimes we just got to let some stuff go. And then, you know, the, the, you, you have people that say, well, you don't know what I've been through. I don't. And you don't know what I've been through. Amen. Amen. But until we can put things aside, until we can lay things down, until we can forget about those things, mm -hmm. we're never going to make progress in Christ. You have to press forward. You have to press on. You have to press to the mark of the high calling of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as long as you want to wallow in your present place, you'll never press on and you'll never reach the mark. You know, it's funny because we had a hog farm when I was a kid. And um, we had this big wallow. And, you know, pigs don't have sweat glands like humans do. And so everybody thinks pigs are nasty and dirty, but pigs aren't really that nasty and dirty. They're not like other farm animals. Other farm animals, they'll go and sit in it and lay in it. Not a pig. You put a pig in a pen, he'll use one corner as his bathroom, and he'll use the other corner for his bed. But he'll never lay in his doo-doo. But cows will. All the other farm animals pretty much do, but not a pig. But we used to have this big, this big wallow. We used to fill it up with water, and that's how pigs cool themselves off in the, in the summertime, and that's how they keep the flies off themselves. They wallow in mud. Not to get dirty. They, they have a specific purpose for doing that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think about Christians that way, just wallowing in the mud, just rolling around in the mud. Can't see Jesus, but I sure am enjoying this mud. Why? Why would you want to wallow in the mud when, you know, you got, you got sweat glands. You're not a pig. You don't have to wallow. Stop. And then Paul even says, I have yet attained. <clears throat> See, he was hoping to attain something. And he said that we have to press on to that thing that we have to attain. See, our God is infinitely creative in the ways that he deals with his children. We look around and say, I wish I was like her, or I wish I was like him, or we watch too many TikTok videos or whatever the heck they call them. Yeah. You know, I want to be like that guy or that girl. I want this and I want that. Why can't you be you? Mm. See, God doesn't want you to be somebody else. That's right. God wants you and calls you to be the best you that you can be. Have you ever thought about that? See, while we think we have to be like so-and-so, you know, I got to dress like so-and-so, and I got to act like so-and-so, and I got to be bad like so-and-so. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Because they're having a lot of fun, so I want to be badder than they're bad. Because they're bad just ain't bad enough for me. I know I could be badder than that. Why can't you get it in your head that God wants you to press to the high mark of the calling of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ? And like I said, God is infinitely creative. 
in terms of how he deals with his children. You know, and let this be our motto as we seek to do God's will. Expect the unexpected and enjoy the journey. Because that's pretty much how it is. You know, instead of getting mad and frustrated and crazy over those things that pop up, just expect it. Stuff happens. Get over it. It's life. If you don't want any more tribulations, well, then you're not alive. Because Jesus himself said, in this world, you'll have tribulation. But he said, be of good cheer. Put on your little happy face and do your happy dance. Because he says, I've overcome the world. And if you're on his team, you're an overcomer and you can overcome the world. You're not stuck in the world. You're better than that. Your passport's stamped for heaven. And you think you're stuck in that slimy dirt hole that all the other pigs are wallowing in. Not so fast, not so much. But expect the unexpected and enjoy the journey. You see, for all of us, our future lies hidden in the hands of a loving God. If we're in Him. If we're following his will, his word, and his ways, our future is hidden in the hands of a loving God. And I know as a loving God, he has awesome plans for you. Somebody just told me a couple days ago, but you don't understand, you know, what my parents did to me. You don't understand what my parents did to me. See, I have scars on my body from what my parents did to me. I was molested when I was a kid, not by my parents, but because of the places my dad took us. You know, my dad wanted to go to strip clubs and crazy places, and um, wasn't good. Matter of fact, one day I was only about nine years old, and my dad forgot that he took me to one of those places. And at three in the morning, they put me out on the street at Mound and Davison. As a little nine-year-old kid, I lived in St. Clair Shores at the time. I was about 17 or 18 miles from home, a nine-year-old kid at 3 o'clock in the morning. I didn't know where to go. The place was called Benson's Boobs Galore, and that's where my dad left me. He went home, drunk as a skunk, and left his son there all by himself. But God. See, I could tell you, your future is hidden in the hands of a loving God, whether you realize it or not. I can tell you absolutely with certainty this morning that God cares about you, loves you, and he's madly in love with you. And you know what? It's just enough to know that God loves you and that God is for you. See, some of us think, uh-oh, <laughs> you know, God's not for me. God must be against me. I'm telling you this morning that God is for you. And therefore, you can trust God with every single detail of life. I remember just as a little kid. You know, it's kind of crazy because um, everything was the opposite in my life. You know, my dad smoked. But we were told, don't smoke. My parents drank, but we were told, don't drink. You know, we were told, don't do this, but they were doing it. You know, and I was only a little kid. I remember very clearly at age six or seven, me crying out to a God saying, I don't want to be like these people. You know, I had an older brother who followed in their pattern followed in their footsteps. My brother smoked cigarettes at first. Then he smoked other things. Then he got involved in drugs. Then my older brother got involved with drinking. There was always alcohol in our home because my parents drank a lot of alcohol. My brother became an alcoholic. And for my whole life, I listened to my older brother say, I can't help it. It's in my DNA. 
And I used to look at them and say, you know what? It's not in your DNA. Because I know this God who I prayed to since I was about five or six or seven years old. And I told him I didn't want to be like these people. And I've never been drunk in my whole life. So we can drown our problems out with alcohol or other things, drugs or whatever your choice is. We can hide our pain through relationships we know we shouldn't be in, sexual exploits or whatever is your bent. Or we can say, God, I know that you can handle all the details of my life no matter how bad. And I know because of you that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The verse that I gave you from Philippians 4.13. Because I know. You know, my brother, his life got so dark when he was 49 years old, he committed suicide. Not only him, him and his girlfriend together committed suicide. It was on the front page of the newspapers because... A double suicide is a big thing. But that was my brother. It was funny because I remember going to the cemetery when my parents had a funeral service for my older brother. And my twin brother said, what the heck are you crying about? And I thought, well, that's my brother. Wasted potential, a wasted life, a beautiful soul. One that thought he knew God but chose a different path. Mm. And I was the one who chose a different path because I knew my God. I didn't know exactly all about him at that young, precious, tender age of five or six or seven, but I cried out to him, Lord, protect me. I remember many times we had a very nice house and very nice beds. I remember sleeping under the bed, not on the bed, because... Mm. It was safer that way. But such is life. But you know what? We can all do what Paul said in Philippians 3.13 and 14. Forgetting that which is behind and press to the high mark of the calling of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If the Apostle Paul said it's possible, then I know it's possible. And that's a life verse of mine. Forgetting those things that are behind and pressing to the high mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I pray this morning that you would do that. You know, I don't know what day your garbage day is, but commit this week to take out the garbage. Take out those burdens. Take those pains. Take that unforgiveness. Take that nonsense that's been holding you back. And put it at the curb and let somebody else deal with it. Amen. Tell yourself, I'm done with this nonsense. Tell yourself, my God's bigger than my pain. My God's bigger than my burdens. My God's bigger than my scars. My God's bigger than my past. Paul said, I have not yet attained. But you know what? I can tell you, when you press to the mark of the high calling of our Savior, Jesus Christ, you will attain. You can attain. And so it is. Like I said, there's going to be unexpected things come up. It's okay. There's going to be craziness that comes up. It's okay. Put your life in the hands of a loving God. It's absolutely enough to know that God loves you. God loves you more than you love yourself. Yep. Have you ever thought yeah. about that? Yeah. God cares and loves you more than you even love yourself. And so therefore, you can trust God with everything. You can trust God with every single detail of your life. And you know what? He already knows all the details. You won't surprise him with any of them. He knows what's in that dumb head of yours. <laughs> and he knows what's in that dumb head of mine, too. So, I mean, I'm not just talking to you. 
So I just pray that we would entrust God to the extent where we trust him enough to allow our lives to be transformed with this gospel. This gospel that was penned, penned at the, the prompting of God's spirit through the hand of the Apostle Paul and through the other writers of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and all the epistles that appear in the New Testament. God will bless you, but you have to engage. If you sit on the sidelines, you know what's going to happen? Nothing. And you can be a bench sitter if you want. You know, or you can engage God. When are you going to start pressing on? That's a question you should ask yourself this week. If that's what the scripture says, when are you going to do it? Only you can answer that question. But I'm just telling you, put your life in the hands of a loving God. And you'll never be the same. Amen? Amen. Let us bow our heads. Gracious Father, I thank you. I thank you for these words of Paul. I thank you for this book of Romans. Lord, it's been my absolute pleasure to preach through this book over the last many months. Bless us, Lord. Bless us as we ponder these words. Bless us as we write these words in the tablets of our minds and on the tablets of our hearts. Let us not just leave this place and soon forget what we've heard. Let us engage what we've heard. Let us ponder on what we've heard. Let us endorse what we've heard. Let us take what we've heard and allow it to change us and transform us. Lord, I can honestly say, I'm not the man that I want to be, but I'm certainly not the man that I used to be. Amen. And I thank you, Lord, for making me the man that I am. Lord, I just pray that you would continue to do a work in each person's heart, in each person's mind that has heard these words. Bless them, renew them, restore them, help them, lead them and guide them and direct them. Show them your way, Lord. Show them your will. Show them your path, Lord. Let them forsake those things that aren't good and godly. Let them lay aside, as Paul said, uh, let us lay aside the sins and the weights that beset us. See, not everything is a sin, but there's a lot of us carry weights that, and burdens that we should not carry. So let us lay aside those weights and those burdens. They might not amount to sin, but we know that we should not be carrying them. Bless us, Lord, as we understand and we acknowledge our desperate need for you. Because without you, each of us are nothing. Show us, Lord. Show big in our lives this week. Show us your greatness and let us magnify how great and grand you truly are. Show us your will, Lord. Demonstrate your will mightily in our lives. Clearly show us your word. Bring your word to clear focus, Lord, even now. Bless us, Lord, as we leave this place. Bless us in ways that we can't even fathom or imagine even now. Help us, Lord. You are a great God. You are an infinite God who is infinitely creative in blessing and helping and leading and guiding. Do that now, Lord, for each of us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray and all the saints said, Amen. Amen.